Right, could I ask members to leave the chamber quietly? The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7994 in the name of Tom Arthur on Brexit's impact on working musicians and Scotland's music industries. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? I call on Tom Arthur to open the debate. Mr Arthur, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you. I remind members of my professional background in music and my membership of the Musicians' Union. Presiding officer, this debate provides an opportunity to highlight the growing concerns over Brexit held by the Scottish and wider UK music communities. These shared concerns are at the heart of the Musicians' Union campaign to protect musicians' rights after the UK leaves the European Union. And I would like to place on the record my thanks to the Musicians' Union for bringing this campaign forward. I would also like to state my thanks to members of Labour, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats who joined my SNP colleagues in supporting this motion. Before turning to the specific implications of Brexit for working musicians and the wider music sector, I would like to provide some context. It is now 16 months since the UK voted to leave the European Union. I, along with the majority of my constituents in Renfrewshire South and the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland voted to remain. However, as I have stated previously in this chamber, I accept the result of that referendum. What I do not accept, however, is that the vote to leave gave the UK government a mandate to take Scotland and the UK out of the single market and consequently end freedom of movement. This is not a view that is unique to me. It is one that I believe to be held by a majority in this parliament. I have no doubt that even many members of the Conservative Party while publicly demurring, still agree that retaining our place in the single market should be the overriding priority, to quote Ruth Davidson's words to this, cha this chamber exactly one week after the Brexit vote. I do not highlight this to make an easy political point, but rather to remind members of a common ground in this parliament that has been obscured by the fog of the battle over Brexit's definition at Westminster. I hope that this debate's concerns with the makers of music that most universal of languages will serve to remind all of us of that shared commitment to the European project which this, which this Parliament expressed with near unanimity in the month preceding the referendum. Presiding officer, the Musicians Union campaign to protect musicians' rights after Brexit has been gathering pace over the past few months. To date, nearly 20,000 people have signed the online petition backing the campaign. This is not surprising, given that a survey carried out by UK Music found that of those working in the sector expressing an opinion, nearly 70% believe Brexit would have a negative impact on the UK music sector. It's therefore vital that politicians back our musicians and back the Musicians' Union campaign. So far, over 100 MPs and peers have indicated their support. And today I hosted the Musicians' Union here in our Scottish Parliament, where many MSPs of, all part of many parties pledged to support to support your support for musicians' rights post-Brexit. I encourage all members who have not yet done so to sign the online petition, a link to which can be found on the Musicians' Union website. The MU campaign itself centres on five key areas. Free movement, copyright protection, workers' rights, rights of EU citizens in the UK, and arts funding. In my remarks, I will give particular focus to the importance of freedom of movement and securing the rights of EU citizens. Presiding officer, all of, us here, all of us here will likely have enjoyed the benefits freedom of movement brings and allowing us to easily visit and holiday in EU countries. However, free movement is not just for the convenience of holidaymakers. It crucially, all permits the free, crucially also permits the freedom to work in any part of the European Union. While there has rightly been much public discussion regarding the single market freedoms to trade, to sell services and move capital, for most people, the only assets that they can monetize are their skills and labor. This is particularly true of performing musicians. For those musicians in Scotland and across the UK, the single market has afforded the opportunity to work in 27 other countries and access a combined market of 500 million people with relative ease. As members of the single market, UK musicians working in EU countries do not require a visa or work permit. Membership of the customs union means we do not need a carnet which is required for transporting equipment across borders. And merchandise sold at concerts is not subject to the duties faced by UK acts touring, for example, in the United States. 
Each of these particular benefits has a significant impact on the profitability of a tour. And this is equally so for musicians from other EU countries seeking to perform in the UK. Leaving the single market and customs union, as planned by the UK government, risks the imposition of a costly bureaucratic regime that could make touring unviable for all but the most established acts. Consequently, it would hinder fledgling talent in Scotland in building a European audience and make it more difficult to attract acts from Europe to perform in Scotland. With the weakened pound caused by the Brexit vote already impacting on the UK's ability to attract international acts, an end to freedom of movement would do significant further damage to the prospects of working musicians in Scotland and the UK's wider music sector. Presiding officer, the second area I wish to highlight concerns the rights of those EU citizens currently living and working in Scotland and the wider UK. The 2016 UK Music Diversity Survey found that EU nationals make up 10% of the UK music industry workforce, compared to an estimated 7% of the UK workforce as a whole. EU nationals can be found performing in our major orchestras and in the teams that support them, teaching music in schools and universities. As students, such as at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, where they make up 17% of the total school of music population and as directors and chief executives of ensembles and festivals. They are our friends, our neighbours and our colleagues who have each made an immeasurable contribution to our country, enriching and enhancing our culture and way of life. The UK government's failure to guarantee their status is utterly shameful. In this parliament and beyond, we must continue to make clear to EU nationals that have made Scotland their home that this is their country too. And we must be relentless in pushing the UK government to do the right thing and guarantee the rights of EU nationals in the UK. Presiding officer, I first spoke in this chamber on a day when Parliament overwhelmingly voted in favour of Scotland and the UK remaining members of the European Union. The events since the 23rd of June last year have only served to strengthen my conviction that Scotland's future is best served in partnership with our European friends and neighbours. Music as a discipline demands a capacity for empathy, understanding and cooperation. As an art, it allows individuality to flourish within a group, leadership to be shared, spontaneity within structure and the possibility to reimagine the familiar. For musicians, there is no more fitting a campaign than one which seeks to preserve our European community of musicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open debate, speeches of four minutes. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And I would like first to thank Tom Arthur for bringing this important issue to the Chamber for debate this evening. And it's fitting that we'll hold this uh, debate today following on from the earlier debate on Brexit negotiations in the Chamber this afternoon. I'd also like to thank the Musicians' Union for coming to the Parliament today and for their briefings on this topic. The disaster that is Brexit continues to unfold. The impact of the ill-advised decision to leave the single market becomes more apparent as the true scale of the chaos of the Brexit negotiations continues to unravel with uncertainty heaped upon uncertainty. The downsides are well documented and often discussed with regards to key sectors of our economy in agriculture, hospitality, manufacturing, financial services, to name but a few. But the impact of Brexit reaches far beyond those key sectors, important as they are. It reaches to all aspects of our economy and our society, every career choice, hobby and leisure pastime that we engage in. It touches the lives and choices of everyone every day because Brexit is not just a debating point for politicians and as a disaster unfolds, the impact on the day-to-day -day lives of everyone in our society becomes more apparent. And I'm glad that Tom Arthur has raised this specific issue because the impact of Brexit on musicians and the music industry clearly demonstrates the scope and reach of leaving the single market into all aspects of our lives on something we understand as consumers of music, if not all, as its creators. In the limited time available, I intend to focus on the impact that the decision to leave the single market will have on touring. Now, while I never reached the heady heights of Mr Arthur's career as a professional musician, I have some very limited experience of gigging internationally in a past life. And I must here declare a current interest as my brother, a resident of Prague for more than a decade, regularly tours with his band across Europe and the UK. 
the chancellors.cz available for bookings <laughs> at least <laughs> at least until Brexit. Touring is the bread and butter of all bands and musicians, both large and small. Making money on the road is hard enough, and it's about to get a whole lot worse for UK musicians. The short-term nature of touring means that normal permits to work rules and bureaucracy, while bad enough for regular work, are completely unsuitable for a life on the road. The end of freedom of movement, the ability to travel and work without visas or permission will cause untold problems for the industry, and we can see the future already. France, for example, already requires work permits for performances by artists from outside the EU. These can only be acquired by a lengthy and complex process administered by French promoters. For UK artists used to short-term visits, this would be a major and costly change. And the UK already imposes restrictions on non-EU touring musicians, stricter than those of most other EU states. If this were to be replicated on UK musicians travelling to the EU post-Brexit, the impact and disruption would be significant. And it's not only restrictions on musicians and crews to freely move between gigs that will be disruptive. It will also prove problematic for transport of equipment, are to be classed as imports, what documentation is required to prove free export, does it comply with non-tariff barriers and product conformance regulations, what type of delays and costs will all this build into the process, and what of merchandise being transported from gig to gig, a key income generator for bands and musicians, how will the import and export of such goods be facilitated in a world where truck queues at Dover will be the norm. Nothing as clear as the Brexit negotiations lurch in every direction except forward. Finally, I want to touch on the fundamental issue of the exchange of artistic ideas and expression, because Brexit not only is a challenge to the day-to-day -day life of musicians, but also challenges some more fundamental concepts. The benefits an open Europe brings has brought over its past decades, the ability for the young and not so young to freely mix and mingle, to exchange ideas and experiences, to understand each other's cultures and each other's music. Brexit is a challenge to those very ideals. And leaving the single market is a bad idea, and the impact on working musicians is but one example of the problems it will cause across all aspects of our society. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Ms Hamilton, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to thank Tom Arthur for bringing this debate to Parliament today. I stand before you as a former very average piano and trumpet player. The Scottish music industry makes a fantastic contribution to Scottish life. Uh, it plays a key role in the creative sector and is rightly celebrated and acknowledged as world class. Of course, we should listen to the concerns of all industries and sectors, and we should work to resolve these concerns. The UK government has indeed noted that the contribution of the music industry and all the creative industries make to the UK economy. It recognises the 87 billion uh, pounds and more it provides to the economy and over 19 billion in exports. The UK government has thus committed to giving all the support necessary for those creative industries to continue to thrive after we have left the EU. And I believe that UK ministers have been working closely with the Creative Industries Council, who represent the whole of the creative industry, to understand both the possible opportunities and the impact presented by the UK's decision to leave the European Union. Also, roundtable meetings have been held with businesses and industry representatives from across the creative industries to discuss these matters. This is the action of a government that seeks to help the music industry and other creative industries with life outside the European Union. It's um, evidence of a proactive government that sees the value in the music industry and sees its importance in the UK economically and, of course, culturally. Indeed, ministers will continue to work closely with the music sector to ensure that its needs and views are understood. The door is very much open for proactive discussion for life after Brexit. It's important, however, that we don't jump to conclusions, as people will well be aware that Brexit negotiations are underway, but be in no doubt that the UK government will fight tooth and nail for the best deal, and it will not sacrifice sectors or industries. It will instead work with their interests in mind. The issues highlighted from the musicians' union are not dissimilar from other sectors. These sectors and industry concerns, including that of the music industries, will rightfully be at the forefront of any of those discussions and negotiations. Leaving the EU door open for new opportunities, such as renegoti renegotiating existing terms of trade, will enable the industry to grow and develop international markets. Brexit doesn't mean that the world will end. Far from it. 
Um, I looked at a quote from Mr Ashcroft of PRS um, on ro royalties um, who have been licensing their rights on a pan-European basis. He says Brexit won't stop that. He also said we are so international that we think our business transcends that. Look at Edinburgh, Glasgow, the Scottish borders. These are cultural hubs. They uh, lead from the front and European cities have taken note of what we offer and sought to replicate. Why now do we assume, because we have chosen to leave the European, that this will change? Will these cities cease to be cultural hubs? Will this be the end of the Edinburgh Festival, the Borders Book Festival and music concerts? Certainly not. And there is no reason to think they will. We should stop conflating Brexit with backwardness. The UK government is working for a progressive Brexit and we are on this side of the chamber are working towards the same. There is much progress to be made on Brexit, but it's time to shift the narrative from the pessimistic and start talking passionately and positively about the opportunities that it can bring. That means renegotiating existing terms of trade to help the music industry and to help it grow. Instead of thinking that we might lose, let's instead think what we might gain. The UK government is supportive of the music and creative industries and getting the best deal for them. Let's work together to find that outcome. Thank you. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Marie Todd. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. And I too would like to thank Tom Arthur for bringing forward this debate and for highlighting the key challenges identified by the Musicians' Union as threats to the members arising from Brexit. Mr Arthur mentioned a number of issues and some of those ought to be easier to address than others. Copyright, for example, could be assured by replicating existing protections, I think Rachel Hamilton was suggesting that was straightforward, under EU law, through the withdrawal bill currently being considered by MPs at Westminster. The problem, as we have heard already today, is that Tory West, uh, ministers at Westminster want to take executive powers to amend such laws, even while they are retained, without further consulting Parliament. And that uh, undermines the assurances given and therefore defeats the apparent purposes of the bill. So there is, uh, it, it ought to be easy to do, but it is not automatic and it certainly uh, will not follow without some significant changes to the bill that's being brought forward at Westminster. Future funding is another area where government can act, including in this case the Scottish Government. The automatic access to Creative Europe's one and a half billion euro budget will be lost after Brexit, as well as access to programmes currently supported by the European Regional Development Fund and replacement of Creative, Scotland's funding, uh, Creative Europe's funding in Scotland will be up to Scottish ministers. And I hope the minister can tell us something this evening about what the government estimates that funding is currently worth to Scottish performers and how ministers plan to replace that uh, after 2020. Clearly, again, replacement of EU structural funding, important to the industry too. That will require agreement on a new framework between the UK and Scottish governments and we need to see a very different approach to UK-wide frameworks uh, from the one currently contained in the EU Withdrawal Bill. So those matters can be sorted out on this side of the North Sea by the Scottish or the British governments or both, but the threats posed by Brexit to freedom of movement and to workers' and citizens' rights can be addressed only through the negotiations uh, between the UK and the EU. A survey by UK Music last year found that 10% of the music industry workforce in the UK held a passport for another European country, compared with an estimate at 7% of the British workforce as a whole. That, of course, means that a relatively, and again, given Ivan McKee's uh, contribution, no surprise, a relatively high proportion of musicians will be able to travel freely within the European economic area after Brexit. But it also uh, reflects just how important Europe is to the sector. For the 90% of British musicians who depend on freedom of movement for their opportunity to work in other European countries, an agreement on citizens' right, rights after Brexit will be essential. Uh, it is not an optional extra or something uh, to be part of a negotiation pro process. That agreement will need to be comprehensive because of the way the industry works. Musicians are often hired to work on an individual project rather than on a long-term contract. The insecurity that brings will become even more of an issue if EU citizens have to meet new employment criteria in order to remain post-Brexit. And of course, the same will apply to UK citizens in Europe. If there is no comprehensive agreement, according to uh, Michael Duggar, the chief executive of UK Music, subjecting European performers to the rules which currently apply to those 
from elsewhere would be hugely damaging both to European musicians working here and to musicians from here working in Europe. And Culture Counts, the umbrella organisation for Scotland's cultural sector, has called for the permit-free procedures used for the Edinburgh Festival Centre to, to, to be deployed more widely in future. Now, we heard earlier this afternoon that there are those in this Parliament who believe that threatening a no-deal Brexit uh, would be a clever thing to do to get more concessions uh, during the negotiations that are ongoing. But in truth, the impact of such an outcome on the cultural life of Scotland would diminish us, just as it would so many other sectors of society and economy. And so it is time, I think, for no dealers to waken up to that reality, start trying to reach agreement with Europe to protect our music and cultural life, as well as our economy, uh, instead of planning to fail. Thank you very much, Marie Todd. We follow by Brian Whittle. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by thanking my colleague Tom Arthur for this debate and thanks too to the um, folks from the Musicians' Union for their campaign. As many of you will know, I am lucky enough to represent the Highlands and Islands, which is home to a vibrant traditional music scene. Because of our history of migration, we have managed to export our musical culture all over the world. Now, we may not have welcomed all of that migration, but the beauty of gospel music from the southern states of America, which may well have its roots in Gaelic psalm singing, cannot be denied. I spoke to a lot of folk when I was preparing for this debate, and it's, I have to say it's very unusual for folk from the art scene to speak with one voice, but on the subject of Brexit, the feelings and concerns that have been expressed to me are pretty much unanimous. When asked them if Brexit will impact upon them, they answer with one voice, yes, badly. Their concerns are pretty clear. Being able to travel easily is essential for many musicians to make a living. Any extra bureaucracy or cost will have a detrimental impact. If migration from Europe is reduced, what will that do to our talent pool? Will we be able to access European funding in future? Finally, if Brexit causes any further squeeze in public finance, which I have to say is almost certain to be the case, will arts funding be a casualty? Just yesterday, the Scotsman reported that the Celtic Connections Festival have been forced to dram be dramatically scale back the number of overseas acts in their lineup because of the slump in Stirling, which has reduced their buying power so significantly. Certainly. Rachel Hamilton. Looking at the um, fantastic uh, music festival held in Glasgow, the Celtic Connection Festival, and um, I noticed it featured artists from around the globe. And I, I also noted that there were um, there's artists from Brazil, the States, and from India. And it didn't seem as though they had been put off by what you're describing. Marie Todd. So <laughs> this, this year, the programme you'll notice if you were a keen follower of Celtic Connections is exactly one-fifth smaller than usual because of the effect of, of the sterling slump on their buying power. Frankly, we'll all be worse off financially and culturally as a result of Brexit. And let's remember, that is something we did not vote for here in Scotland. In the Highlands, kids are engaged and immersed in music from primary school till school leaver age and beyond. And the hugely popular Face Ross music programme, which now extends way beyond Rosshire. It's common for young musicians from home to travel all around music for festivals. Is that going to continue? One of those young musicians, Joseph Peach from Achiltebu, is now in his final year at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. He articulated very clearly and passionately his many concerns, and I'll quote him directly on one aspect. He says, it's heartbreaking to look around, to see world-renowned institutions like the European Baroque Orchestra and the European Youth Orchestra leaving the UK, to look around to my fellow students, lecturers even, from other parts of the EU, who with the inevitable introduction of income thresholds that at current levels are far unrealistic for those working in the arts to meet, will, they be, un will be unlikely to remain here long term. Now, we have a plethora of musical talent in the Highlands, so I thought I would finish with some words from post-punk legend Edwin Collins, who lives, in a recording who lives in Helmsdale now and has a recording studio up there. 
He sang Never Known a Girl Like You before at my celebration when I was elected, which was obviously a high point of my life. <laughs> and he was accompanied by a Cayley band, which is a fine example of fusion, if ever there was one. He says, the UK music business is serious money, a big contributor to the GDP. But as, as musicians are in the industry of human happiness and personal freedoms, I remember travelling the corridors of East Germany and four full border checks to get into West Berlin and four more to get out again. I remember massive carnet paperwork to get from Belgium to Germany or Italy to France. Musicians will always be on the side of free movement and increased cooperation between countries. Our collection agencies across Europe and the rest of the world and therefore our incomes rely on reciprocity. We will always be about cross-pollination of ideas and against anything that seeks to divide us. On Brexit, I really think we should rip it up and start again. Brian Whittle to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, can I thank Tom Arthur for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate and I do recognise Mr Arthur's particular interest in and knowledge of uh, the music industry. He is also aware of my own interest in music, although perhaps our musical tastes differ somewhat. Uh, I do note that many years ago when I was asked about my ambitions by a sports magazine, I answered that I actually wanted to play guitar in a rock band. And uh, many, many years ago I did actually play guitar in a rock band. It went by the name of Oasis although not perhaps the one that everybody recognises now. And I've got to say, if I was asked again uh, 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 about my ambitions, that one would particularly remain, although I have to say my musical career was tragically cut short through a severe lack of talent. <laughs> now, I also wanted to state for the record that, uh, that I was very much in the Remain camp during the Brexit referendum, given that uh, the business I was a director in had its main technology office in Prague and employed talent from all over Europe and beyond. And I was disappointed to be on the losing side of that vote, but apparently we do live in a democracy. And where Mr Arthur and I agree is the importance of the economic and cultural contribution made by Scottish music industry by, uh, by EU citizens and from the rest of the world for that matter. And I would definitely want this to continue. What his motion fails to address, though, however, is the economic and cultural contribution made by Scottish citizens to the global music industry, including the EU. And with, and, and with much of the SNP rhetoric around Brexit, this motion also fails to recognise two key points. There are two sides in this negotiation. I will happily take an intervention. Tom Arthur. It's not SNP rhetoric, it's rhetoric of the Musicians' Union. 30,000 musicians across the UK so would you like to correct that point? Uh, no, I'm not going to correct Brian that Whittle. point. I'm not going to correct that point, uh, Mr Arthur, because it's your motion. And, uh, and the rhetoric in this chamber, as I said, uh, it continues to, have, uh, to miss two points. And that is, there are two sides in the negotiation, with citizens on both sides with similar needs. needs. And why is it when we're, when, when we're only discussing EU nationals working and living in Scotland, why do Mr Arthur and his party consistently fail to mention the reciprocal arrangements required by our musicians plying their trade overseas? And number two, the world extends beyond the EU, and that world somehow manages to work with the UK quite well, thank you very much. In fact, a far greater proportion of foreign workers migrating to the UK and to Scotland have traditionally come from outside the EU. And how have they managed? And what did we do before the European Union? We had to struggle along with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. We imported Elvis and Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix, who spent much of his time living in London, actually. How on earth did we manage? I absolutely agree that we should strive to maintain the diversity in cultures in the development of the arts in many other areas. And with that in mind, I am happy to continue to encourage any musician from anywhere in the world to come and apply their trade in Scotland. The reality is that when Brexit is finally agreed, Musicians from around the world, including the EU, will continue to be welcome to Scotland, as well as an opportunity for Scotland's musicians to travel and work around the world. The Prime Minister, as we've already heard earlier on today, has unequivocally stated that all EU nationals living and working legitimately in the EU, she wants to remain. Because that's the nub of the issue here, I, I think, for the, for the SNP. A successful Brexit kills their own constitutional ambitions stone dead, 
So they're doing everything they can possibly can to throw as many spanners in the works as they can. So, from, so, so far from trying to aid, uh, to aid a positive outcome for the UK and Scotland, what the SNP are doing is hiding behind Brexit in the hope it deflects away from their failings in other governmental departments. Presiding officer, music is an international, global industry. So I will hopefully continue to enjoy many music events throughout Scotland, as is my want. And I'm quite confident that Brexit will not affect those events, no matter what they, where the artists come from. I have recently enjoyed, I go to many concerts and recently enjoyed Alter Bridge in Edinburgh, and I've just purchased tickets to see Brian Adams. Brexit will not affect these events one bit, and I will continue to welcome these acts from around the world to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Gillian Martin, and Gillian Martin will be the last speaker in the open debate. Polly McNeill, please. Thank you. Uh, my sincere thanks to Tom Arthur for choosing to bring this motion for debate. Um, like others that I've learned this evening, uh, fellow musicians in the chamber, I declare my own interest uh, as a practising musician. In fact, I'm currently touring Glasgow. Um, and that is challenging enough, let me tell you. Because if you talk to um, musicians um, that don't have the full entourage paid for and they do it themselves, they'll tell you it's not a glamorous profession. Um, when, we, when you pack your gear, you do it yourself. Tom knows this. Um, it takes hours to set up and hours to derig um, just to get the, the chance to play for an hour or two, but you've got to love it. Um, so as you can see, music is a passion for me, but it is for many Scots. In fact, uh, Scotland sells more live tickets than any other part of the United Kingdom. And therefore, that's why I think that the debate that Tom Arthur's brought uh, this evening is important because music deserves our attention, and particularly in relation to Brexit. Scotland's always punched above its weight when it comes to music. I was pleased to hear uh, the mention of the wonderful Edwin Collins, uh, but such the mention of a few others, Franz Ferdinand, Biffy Clyro, Travis, Katie Stunsell, one of my own favourites, and the fantastic Paola Nettini. Um, so Scotland has a lot to offer when it comes to music. Um, but I think it's a mistake to uh, not conclude that Brexit will be easy uh, for musicians touring around uh, coming to Britain. I think the impact will be hard felt. And I think that there is a potential of a great deal of, of harm if we don't get the Brexit arrangements correct. So I would like to add my voice to the Musicians' Union petition uh, about the serious and potential consequences of leaving the European Union. The music sector has always needed a bit of support because you think about all the top acts that you know. And nowadays, I think uh, Brian Whittle talks about, well, the Beatles managed it in 1967, but I think many bands tour with a lot more equipment now and there are some acts that are much, much, much bigger. So it isn't just the freedom of movement of people, but there's all the, there's all the negotiating um, the equipment as they move around. Uh, the, Yes, I will. Marie Tond. Thank you very much for allowing me to intervene. I wonder if you would agree with me that, the, that what didn't happen back in the 1960s and certainly has been happening in the last few years is the opportunity for young people from Scotland to travel over, all over Europe and participate in festivals which celebrate our shared Celtic musical heritage. Polly McNeill. Yeah, I think that seems to be true, and I was quite staggered. I didn't know that Celtic Connections had reduced the size of the, uh, because of the problems with freedom of movement. I wasn't aware of that at all. Um, but there are serious concerns to, to overcome, and I think because it's based on the simple notion that being part of the European Union has meant that for musicians they are freely able to travel without barriers and take all their instruments and equipment with them. Scotland has a reputation that's worth defending our excellence in music. And as, as Marie Todd said, it's the extent of live music these days um, that has had the biggest impact and in interaction um, with Europe. It would be a serious loss to Scotland if there were touring um, and performing acts that had to scale back, which has been suggested by some serious people um, in advance of this debate. And as others have said, we'd be, we'd be a, a far and less and vibrant country if we didn't have the full presence of music and performing arts. All our lives would be less fun without that diverse choice of music and therefore I fully support the motion and the petition by the Musicians Union presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gillian Martin.
Thank you, President Officer. And again, thank you to Tom Arthur for securing what I think has been a very interesting and important debate. I want to talk about part-time or amateur musicians. And I feel I should declare an interest, uh, albeit not a financial one, as the wife of a musician who juggles his life as a teacher, with that as a lead singer in his spare time, one who's played all over the EU in the past, quite the opposite of a financial interest, in fact. As a partner of any part-time musician will tell you, the only money that seems to go in any direction seems to be out the door rather than back in the door. Um, and I've also got another interest to declare as well. My father and my niece are in the Ellen and District Pipe Band together, and they've had a very close relationship with Masek in Belgium for about the last 20 years, albeit not, not my, my niece, but my father, going over to, to, to Masek um, often uh, a couple of times a year, um, and, and they've enjoyed the freedom of movement opportunities that that's brought, and great friendships have built up as a result of that. Semi-professional, part-time, novice or amateur musicians could be the ones that are completely squeezed out of the opportunities to perform in other EU countries as a result of Brexit. And they barely break even as it is. Membership of the EU and all that brings, we've mentioned today, freedom of movement, customs union, membership of the single market, are the gateway to UK performers being able to access international audiences. And a band or a performer squeezing in a tour or a festival performance between their other commitments um, for whom it's not their main occupation, they're lucky to recover the costs of their overheads um, as a result of those endeavours. And more restrictions on them could be the difference between them playing overseas or not. I mean, how much more fundraising are Ellen and District Pipe Band going to have to do to continue this relationship that they have with their, their friends in Mosaic? What a terrific shame it would be if they decided it wasn't worth it. And of course, the same applies to young bands wanting to make a name for themselves. Uh, whatever they can, accessing opportunities in EU countries with the minimum of red tape and expense. Um, and that's not just a shame, it's, it's actually crucial for the future success of the Scottish and the UK music industry, as many people have mentioned before me. And let's look at what a hard Brexit or a no-deal situation could mean to, to performers. Out with the EU, you're in a customs carne requirement situation, which is, as was mentioned, onerous. And at the moment, performing in EU countries, you pack up your kit, you fly out with it, you collect it from the carousel, you perform with it, you come back home again. No red tape, no more planning other than the normal carrier restrictions on luggage and your travel insurance. No proof required that you're not going to sell it that gear while you're in that EU country. Because if you did sell it, you're in the single market, so all is well. And then there's the freedom of movement aspect. Would it be realistic for a semi-professional musician or a band heading into a country to get a work visa for a one-off performance in a festival? The fee for which might barely even cover the travel costs at all. How much would that visa cost? How long would it take to get? It's all beginning to sound that it's just not worth it. So at the moment, the cost of travelling to a gig in an EU country um, whether that's part of a festival lineup or a one-off gig, it's probably going to cancel out any fee for that gig. But, you know, hey, we don't necessarily do this for the money. But all the same, you'll have less semi-professional um, musicians or young bands taking up those opportunities if it really starts to cost them. So that will mean that only wealthy kids can be in bands that take up these opportunities. Ugh, the best bands I know came out of the working class. Everyone knows that. Do I need to mention them? So one way you make a performance in another EU country equitable, as has been mentioned, is by selling merchandise when you're there. If you sell enough CDs and T-shirts, badges, whatever, you might cover some of the costs. But hang on, in the future, UK, Brexit UK, you won't be part of the single market. So to sell your merch, you might need some kind of uh, export licence on top of the customs carnet and the work visa. And how much will that cost? And how long will you have to wait for that and what paperwork's involved in that. So it's really starting to not look that it's worth it. So I guess what I'm saying, there's a lot more to music than big successful touring bands with managers and accountants and record companies behind them doing all that paperwork and all that red tape management. Um, but consider this, not one of those big professional touring bands haven't ever been in that situation where they were that young struggling band or that semi-professional band or juggling a job and doing it at the weekends. And if, if, if we don't encourage those people, what we're going to end up is a music industry that's only got wealthy kids becoming bands. And I don't really want to listen to that kind of music. So we stop with the ease at which Scottish and UK musicians can make their name internationally 
and reach a wider audience. And then you're going to make it more difficult for the success stories to emerge. End of story. Thank you very much. Uh, call on Michael Russell to close the government. Minister, seven minutes and no need to make a declaration of your musical talents unless you feel it's necessary. I'm <laughs> glad that you already recognise the talent that exists, presiding officer. Um, can I congratulate uh, uh, Tom Arthur on putting this issue to Parliament and welcome Caroline Sewell and Jennifer Laidler from the Musicians' Union to the gallery today. Uh, this has been a Musicians' Union uh, campaign and it's had the strong support of many in this parliament, and I have to say that the Scottish Government agrees with the terms of the motion. Brexit, and particularly an end to free movement, could undoubtedly have a negative impact on the Scottish music industry. The single market not only supports Scottish and EU mus musicians in a business sense, it allows artists to circulate, collaborate across borders, exchange ideas, encourages creativity, and it means that there is much innovation. Indeed, I was struck by uh, a point that Marie Todd made, that in a sense, that free movement is uh, the exact parallel of artistic freedom. It allows that cross-politication of ideas. It's the essence of artistry. And if you crack down on that, if you mean, say that free movement is no longer available, then inevitably you're going to diminish the ability of musicians to contribute to society and con to contribute to each other. Scotland's got a, a rich tradition across all musical forms. We've heard some of that tonight. Some of it's present in this chamber. Uh, and national performing companies have international reputations in classical music. Scottish traditional music and its influence is known the world over. And again, Marie Todd made, made that point very eloquently. And our contemporary artists are at the cutting edge of many different genres. I have to say my own <coughs> musical interests are, as Mr. Arthur knows, uh, slightly eclectic. Um, I studied music at school. Uh, there's not much that I like that was uh, uh, composed uh, after 1900 and virtually nothing after 1940. I do remember uh, having a visit to my house in Argyll from Anne Lauren Gillis, who looked in the days when there were CDs and who looked at my massive rack of CDs, because I am very enthusiastic about music, with some uh, incomprehension to discover that the bulk of them uh, represented English romantic composers of the 19th century. But we all have our particular um, uh, fondnesses, and as uh, Polly McNeill has pointed out, diversity in music, as in many other things, is to be welcomed. I, I suspect I pretty much endorse uh, Albert Schweitzer's view of music, who said that the way to uh, overcome the misery of life, and in my case, that is presently the misery of Brexit, uh, is to be fond of both music and cats. And I have to say I endorse both of those things. Uh, but I have to say also, it's a pity that this debate then heard, and I have to think that Brian Whittle is genuinely fond of, of rock music, and I'd be fond to see, I'd be f I'd be interested to see him performing, though I'm sure I wouldn't like it, but that's nothing to do with Brian Whittle, that's to do with my own personal taste. Well, maybe it is something to do with Brian Whittle, but not an awful lot. But I was awfully sorry to hear both uh, Brian Whittle and, and Rachel Hamilton is take the, the, the position that I think Citizen Smith took in that uh, television programme, which essentially is good news, comrade, the butter ration has been cut. Uh, it said there is apparently to be no difference from freedom of movement. Freedom of movement apparently can be abolished with no consequences at all for the music industry. Well, that is not what the Musicians' Union say, of course. Brian Whittle. I, I, I thank the mayor for taking the intervention. I, I will be delighted to, to, to bring my uh, Gibson SG in and, and uh, deafen you. Um, does the member recognise that in Glasgow is the, the third biggest uh, city in the world uh, for live music, uh, as was recently uh, established, and that predominantly a lot of that live music comes from well outside the EU, especially from uh, United States of America? Minister. Yes, I do recognise that, but it's not either or. This is the line, the equivalent of the line that Michael Gove has taken in, in debate with me, which is to say that he doesn't believe in a migration policy uh, that makes a difference between the Polish plumber and the ba Bangladeshi builder. The trouble with the Tory position is this, is that the Tories don't want either of them to be here. Because if the argument was that freedom of movement was being abolished, but there'd be a much wider view of allowing people into the country, I could sort of understand it, but it wouldn't make much difference. But actually, abolishing freedom of movement goes hand in hand with a view that migration is not desirable. And we've seen that at cultural events and festivals this very year in Scotland. So this is part of an overall approach from the Conservative government, which seeks to restrict entry into this country. And moreover, an approach that was not voted for by, the, by Rachel Hamilton's constituents, nor by those who voted for Mr., or the area which Mr. Whittle represents. Because Scotland said no to Brexit, 
And that meant saying no to the end of freedom of movement. And yet again, we have heard from the Tories that this is what they want to impose. Now, there is bound to be an effect. No matter how small there is bound to be an effect. And the Musicians Union are absolutely right about that. And what it puts at risk is some really important things. Let me just mention two or three of them, presiding officer. The national performing companies, 21% non-UK uh, non -UK EU nationals in the permanent performing staff. We know that those people are affected by Brexit. Amy MacDonald recently stated in the Times she would consider relocating from Glasgow, from that great city, uh, to the continent due to concerns about Brexit and her ability to attract people to play with her. Edinburgh's festivals have audiences of more than four and a half million. In 2016, the International Festival had 2,000 artists from overseas, the largest group of whom were from the rest of the EU. Free movement supports that amazing international showcase. And music tourism is valuable to the Scottish economy. A report by UK Music in 2016 called Wish You Were Here indicated there were 1.2 million music tourists in Scotland in 2016, many of whom will have come from the EU. And we welcome the recent report by the Creative Industries Federation into global talent. It addresses the creative industries as a whole and not just music. And it demonstrates the scale of the challenge that Brexit presents to all creative and cultural organisations. It shows the vital role that non-UK nationals play. Now, that's not to say that some will not be here. But freedom of movement is tailor-made to make sure as many as possible come here. And they have the opportunity to do whatever they want. And moreover, artists can go elsewhere without let or hindrance, the point that Marie Todd made. I am sure there are people throughout the continent of Europe who wish to hear Mr. Arthur play. We should be keen to export him, not permanently, of course, <laughs> but we should be keen to export him to make sure he is heard. And there may be even those who wish to hear Mr. Whittle on his, his Gibson. We should not deny them that opportunity in Berlin or Barcelona, but it will be denied if Brexit goes ahead. So, presiding officer, I just want to make it absolutely clear. Tom Arthur and the Musicians' Union are right on this matter. Brexit will impact on music as it will impact on all cultural industries, on all aspects of our lives. Mr Chapman was endorsing, uh, asking us earlier to be cheerful. There are no reasons to be cheerful about Brexit, and it's time the Tories admitted it. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.